Okay. Let me know when you're ready for the clap. <laughs> yeah. Tried to beat you. It was good. You did beat me. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> Bill. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. All mind. right. Coming down in three, two. I kind of feel like, Bill, I want to either hand you my wallet or ask you, have you ever had a nickname similar to the one you have now, which is the banker around the <laughs> NHL? Uh, how many people are calling you saying, listen, uh, can you hold this? Can you hold that? Can you hold a couple bucks for me now because I think a lot of people are surprised that and we looked around teams around trade deadline who could hold some money I don't know that your Minnesota Wild were the top of any list no I don't think so first of all don't give me your wallet you don't want me to handle your wallet <laughs> um we did get a few more calls after that and you know um yeah it's just funny how it worked out you know we got these two calls uh you know late in the day mm -hmm. and um it just seemed like really good value and we have, you know, even the, the, the spot that we're in with, with our dead cap space, we have a considerable amount of, of cap space to, you know, to utilize. And the, both these moves that, that we did um, never, th they don't take us out of doing anything that we want to do right. as well. So it was kind of a, kind of a win-win. I give a lot of credit to my, uh, my assistant GM, Chris O'Hearn. Mm -hmm. he, he did all the legwork on it and, um, he's a much smarter guy than I am. So piecing it together and dealing with the other AGMs or GMs. He, that, that was actually my question. Do you just say to him, Chris, come back to me when you have the answers and yeah. tell me yes or no. <laughs> like, don't bother me with the numbers. Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, he, he got, he got the call from the other AGMs mm -hmm. and, you know, we, he comes, just says, you know, would you consider this? Do you want to, do you want to do this? And we kind of go over it and, you know, call Craig Leopold our owner because it's it's his money. Yeah. And um, you know, we just talk about it quickly and but we we try to make our decisions quick and I think that's why we're able to kind of capitalize on it. One of the things that I certainly I'm curious about, I think a lot of people might be as well, is there an agreed upon amount that a fourth round draft pick is worth, that a fifth round draft pick is worth? Or is it all different sort of team to team? Like when someone says, hey, can you hold this amount of money? It's like agreed upon, like, okay, for this compensation, we get a fourth or we get a fifth or we get a whatever. Is that sort of agreed upon generally amongst managers? You, I mean, in the past, it's it's been a lot more. Like I, I really felt like we got, you know, good value for the the money that we spent. Mm -hmm. Um you know, you can look to the, you always look to the past and see like, okay, in, in this year, a fourth rounder went for X. Right. So that's what it should be or a fifth rounder, sixth rounder, et cetera. Um, but we just, we got, we just feel like we got really good deals. So we couldn't, we couldn't really say no. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because I was listening to your answer there and I remember talking to a GM once about his relationship with his owner. And he said to me that my owner at the beginning of the year gives me a budget. And I'm allowed to do whatever I need to do in that budget. But I also know that if I'm going to make a big move, I have to warn him first. Like, my, I feel my job is no surprises. He says, I'm allowed to do small things that won't bother him at all. But I think if there's anything that's big, I warn him. Other than that, I don't bother him with trivial things. So I'm always interested in that. How a GM yeah. feels about the owner, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, 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 since day one, I told Craig, uh, you'll never be surprised. You're never going to get an alert on your phone or mm -hmm. whatever. And I almost said, pick up the paper. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to get an alert on your phone saying, you know, the Minnesota Wild, uh, you know, have made this move. You're going to know well, well before that. Um, you know what? Small things that, you know, don't make a difference. No, we'll, we'll just do it. Yeah. But like things like this, yeah, he he's got to know, and and we've got to get his okay. But he's he's been like, it's so important to have support from the top, mm -hmm. and and we do. So another GM said to me, the number one thing he thinks about when he takes a job is, can I win with that owner? He said that, and this is a guy who's been in multiple places, some good, some bad. He says it doesn't matter what your roster is. It doesn't matter what your organizational philosophy is. If you don't have an owner you think you can win with, you're doomed. 
How did you establish that with Craig Leopold? You know what? I think I just I think Craig and I just hit it off, you know, personality goals. Um, you know, and and I I think I've gained his trust and uh over the the short time that I've been in Minnesota, we we as a group have been extremely responsible and uh thoughtful with his money. And I think because of that, he he trusts us. And you know what? I can make the call. I feel comfortable enough making the calls to him, and uh, we can we can discuss the the tougher things. And you know, we we get along very well, and I think that that definitely helps. But um, yeah, whoever the the other GM was, I I totally agree agree because you need that support from the top to in order to build a winning franchise. Um, it takes money. It takes a lot of money. What's the baby? What's the most expensive thing that people don't know about? Stick budgets. Yeah, God, <laughs> stick budgets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what? You know what creeps up, honestly, or just just payrolls. Mm-hmm. You know what? If you have a big scouting staff, a small scouting staff, it it, it creeps up in there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, equipment costs are are crazy. I mean, skates and sticks are just they're so expensive now. Travel. Mm-hmm. I mean. You know, we, we we all charter and we all never stay in, hungry. League. We all stay in you know <laughs> hotels like this. The, the travel is is incredible, but uh, I mean, it all adds up. When you were a player, I mean, you're a great guy, and I'm sure when you were a player, you weren't shy about handing a kid a stick. Hey, here you go, young man. Hey, young lady, no problem. Now, as a manager, when you see your players just handing out sticks whenever they see fit and getting the applause as being the generous one here. What goes through your mind? I love it. You know why? Because that kid is a future fan. You know, he's a future season ticket holder. He's a future jersey buyer or whatever. And you know what? So it's an investment. Yeah, I think so. And I think, hey, look, I don't want guys throwing sticks out left and right. (laughs) Of course, we have a budget. But you know what? I think that also says something about the players in our game, too, Mm -hmm. that they're willing to, you know, take the time and, you know, connect with with a young fan and I, I i think it's important yeah i mean yeah they're dollars right but there's there's also something more to that you just made a kid's life like or day or week or whatever mm-hmm. you, you just had a connection to them well, what's the um and i'm sure there's a few but are there a couple of things that come to mind right away that you think of when when you were a player you believed x mm. but now that you're a manager you believe y Look at that smile that he had on his face as you asked <laughs> there's that question. So, there's so much. You know, when you're a player, I guess the biggest thing uh, is is when you're a player, you worry about this little area right here, just, just you, and you get yourself ready for the game. Of course, you worry about your team and your teammates and stuff, but you have to prepare yourself. You show up to the, the game. Everything's there for you. You show up, you step on the ice, everything just happens and fans are in the building. And, but the amount of work and the amount of people it takes to put on an NHL game is crazy. I mean, ushers, you know, vendors, you know, just the, the trainers, the equipment guys, uh, everything that goes on to just put on one game. Mm-hmm. is is actually incredible and there's just there's so much you know what like you see the people riding around on the zamboni you don't just pick some guy out of the you know oh, yeah. the, the, and stick him on the zamboni no there's like a program for that and there's you know the little kids sitting on the bench and you know people organize that and there's just so much that goes into it and i think that's the I think that's the one thing that that really – and you know what, too? Honestly, where do the players come from? Players just don't show up. Like in the, yeah. You know what? There's scouts. There's development guys. There's this. There's that. It's just a whole huge process to get everything going just, just for that game. That's a, Jeff, that was a great question. And, you know, one of the things is that uh, people say is that you can tell the GMs who are former players who are really serious about it and really aren't. Like, you played for a long time. You clearly loved playing. When you transitioned, like, how hard was the transition? And, we're, like, people said to me, like, they go into this dinky rink in Czech Republic, and Steve Eisen would be there, and he'd be like, holy smokes, like, this guy is for real. 
Like, what was that like for you, the transition and trying to stay in the competition when you were never going to have it on the ice again? Well, that's just it. You stay in the competition, you know, um, you know, as, as professional athletes or, or, you know, even other businesses or walks of life when you're competitive, I, for, for me, it was impossible to not have something like that in my life. Like I couldn't just stop and just mm-hmm. kind of smell the roses. No, I need to, I need to, needed to compete. And, you know, this, you can't play forever, unfortunately. So this was, this is the way you do that. And yeah, you know what? You, you go to the, you go to the Czech Republic, you know, you go to Sweden, Finland, all these places and, you know, all over Canada, the U S you know, to, to get one player or, you know, you're battling for a college free agent or a free agent junior kid or a European free, like, or the draft or whatever you're, you're competing against everybody to, to get those players. And that kind of, that, that drives you too. But just the whole, the whole thing gave me, you know, it, it, it fills that void. You know, there is a little gap between playing and management where, um, I, I was a mess. Like, you know, you don't have any place for your, for your energy, you know, just a little workout doesn't do it. You know, you need it, you need it mentally more than anything else. How did you get past that? I started working right away. Like it, it you know, I took a couple months off, you know, Ray, I went, when I got cut, let go in Philadelphia, when I tried out there, I always say my first phone call was to my wife. Um, we both know, knew I was going to retire. And then my second call was to Ray Shiro. And I said, Ray, I, I need to come in and talk to you uh, soon about the second half of my, the second stage of my life. And I went in to talk to him and he said, look, it, we'll, we'll do something, but you need to take time off. So I, I don't know, it took like, I only took like three months off, maybe four. And it was, I mean, it was good in some ways, you know, and, but it was horrible in other ways. And, and when I started, and then I, I, I started working part time for no pay, just, just, uh, uh, expenses. Um, it was, it was awesome. And I just, I got bit by the bug and this is what I wanted to do. Do you still catch yourself going game by game or? Do you allow yourself to take the bird's eye view of because you can get so wrapped up in the emotional roller coaster yeah. as as a as a player? You know this a lot better than me and Elliot. Yeah. Are you? I, I, was it a tough transition going from the I'm in this fight, you know, every single swing, every single kick, every single everything to you know what we're going to take a more 360 view, maybe a bird's eye view, and look at you know, the season in segments as opposed to just period by period by period as a player? Well, when I first started out, I, I was never around. I mean, I think in, until, uh, you know, until Jim Rutherford came in, I was never around the big team. I was on the road all the time. I was, mm-hmm. you know, dealing with all of our uh, prospects in Pittsburgh. So, yep. you know, traveling to colleges and junior and Europe and things like that and doing some scouting. And so I was never around the big team to be involved, like, you know, period by period. It, that didn't come until, uh, you know, a little later in my, my career. And then I was the assistant GM. So I was still traveling more than I was with the big team. Right. And, um, you know, but now as a general manager, yeah, you can get caught up in it. Like if we're in a big game, like, you know, tonight we have a big game. You know, there are times I do, some nights I get emotional and some nights I'm like, you know, pretty cool. I wish I could be cool all the time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, there have been, uh, there have been nights where, yeah, I, I, I get upset, but you know, you have to, you have to take a step back and really realize where you, you are like, and where your where your team actually is. But I always, I, I just always think we can win. Do you, what's the angriest you've ever been after a game and have you ever confronted a player or stopped yourself from confronting a player after a game? Um, I've talked to players after games, but I always, I always try to think back in my career and I, and I played for some 
some great general managers, some really good people. And like even Lou, who's, mm-hmm. you know, Lou, Lou's, you know, his reputation is, is he's tough. He's as tough as they come and this and that. But, you know, was I ever confronted by him or Glenn Sather after a game and been like, no, you know what? So I, I try to think back about the way I was treated by some of these great general managers. Mm-hmm. And I, and I really try to, you know, I, I try to utilize that, like my own experiences. Did, was I ever treated like that? Did my general managers ever do that? And if the answer is yes, maybe I'll do it. If the answer is no, then there's a good chance I, I won't. Um, I do, though, I have a good relationship with our players, I feel. Um, I like to talk to them. I like to know what's going on, how they're feeling. If, if I can help them in any way, I will. You know, I've had multiple talks with guys like Marcus Foligno and Ryan Hartman and Jordan Greenway and guys like that. Guys who, you know, it's tough for me to, like a Matt Zuccarello, like I could never play like that, right? Mm. But I could play like those other three guys. So I feel like I can connect with them uh, and, and kind of give them my my uh give them my advice on what like a power forward or a gritty forward should should play like or what they can do better to have more success so i talk to the guys a lot yeah and i like to joke around with them too i'm not you know i haven't changed that way Hmm. as far as managers go whose style do you like like as a player we always think of i want to play like bill garen i want to play like so and so but as a manager like who do you look at and go I like the way this guy does things. I like the way this guy conducts himself. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many of them. Uh, you know, obviously Lou, you know, because Lou is there, – there's no BS. You know, I, I love his his mm-hmm. theory of we don't have a lot of rules, but the rules we have, we follow. Mm-hmm. And it is cut and dry. And I, I really respect that. And I've – you know what? I've had – I had my own personal battle with Lou. Yeah, contract. But, but I but I learned so much from that, and I, I lean on that now. Um, you know, I learned a lot from Jim Rutherford and Ray Shiro, um, you know, dealing with guys like when Rob Blake and I did the Kevin Fiala deal. I really like the way Blake, he, he's just such a, like, good, even-keeled guy mm-hmm. um, to deal with. There's no – it was kind of more like right to the point. Um, you know, but I, but I could say that about, about most of the guys. I mean, I, I really like dealing with everybody. And you know what? We all have our own style too. Sure. And we're all, I, I think it's really important to, to, uh, to, to understand that we are all in different situations. We all have different owners, different markets, mm-hmm. different teams. Uh, we're all in different stages. So it's, you have to respect where everybody else is coming from. What was the first time? Because you, there was a time where you were trying to work out a deal with Parise and the Islanders. So, as you mentioned, you were traded from New Jersey to Edmonton while you were in a contract dispute with yeah. Lou Lamorello. What was it like to call him up and try to make a trade with him? Oh, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. And, uh, I mean, he doesn't leave any stone unturned, right? And he puts a lot of thought into it. And, um, you know, I, I love talking to him because – I've known him for so long and we've just, you know, we've, we've had, you know, been through a lot together and we won a Stanley cup together and all those things. I have the greatest respect for him. So I always feel like I'm learning something, you know, even when we were trying to make a trade and, you know, I remember we were going through certain things. He's like, you got a pen and paper. I'm like, Oh no shit. I better get one. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but that, that's, that's always fun. One of the things that I'm always curious about is how much do general managers know about what's going on with other general managers? And I'll, I'll couch it this way. How often are you surprised at a trade? Or do you generally have a sense of what's going to happen out there? No, I mean, no. There, There's trades that we're surprised by all the time. Like we don't, like you don't know everything that's going on. I think... uh and I, I think that's good because I think when you go down the road with another team, um, you know, and I know you think that you can just kind of take a turn and start shopping that player to everybody else. You can't, you can't do that. Like, um, 
so yeah, you, you're not you're not informed on every deal that's going to happen in the league. Mm-hmm. You, you're you're surprised by by you know most of them. Do you like? I, I've heard GM say like, if I if a trade goes down, I don't know about it. I consider that a failure on myself. Do you ever think like that or anything like no. that? No. no, no, because I might not be in the market for anything or that type of player. So, you know, I'm not, and I, I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't call around. I don't want to waste anybody's time either. You know, so if I don't have interest in anybody on that team, I, I don't necessarily just call just to kind of kick tires and this and that. It's just, it's not really my style. Okay. I want to talk about some fun stuff about Bill Guerin. So I asked some people, like, give me a good younger Bill Guerin story. Because <laughs> one of the tough things, I, I re-listened to the Spinning Chicklets interview you did with those guys. And it was so good. And you told so many stories. I was like, I've got to find something a little bit different. So one of the stories I heard about you, we can't name the type of car because our sponsor is different. <laughs> but I heard <laughs> that when you were like a young teammate with the Fitzgeralds, that you used to borrow yeah, Tom's yeah. car a lot without him knowing. Oh, yeah. And later, when you were traded to a team Tom was on, you presented him with a miniature model of that car. Yeah. Is this story true? Yes. Explain it. Yes. So so I played uh, junior hockey in Massachusetts with Scott Fitzgerald, mm-hmm. Tommy's younger brother. So Tommy was playing for... Springfield Indians mm-hmm. and and his brother Scott moved out to Western Mass and so when Fitzy would go on the road with the Indians me and Scotty would go and grab his sports car and tool around for a couple days in it <laughs> and I remember there there I think he had one CD it was it was like Eddie Money's greatest hits <laughs> great CD. you know it was great Hold CD on. he was know, big in the 80s so awesome. you're like <laughs> we're cruising around if I could walk on water <laughs> it was it was like go time. So I got traded to Pittsburgh and uh, we we're just laughing about kind of how everything's come full circle and yeah. whatever. I forget where I was, but I see this model of the exact car, like exact model, exact color and everything. And I bought wow. it for him and I brought it into practice the next day. I said, remember this? <laughs> <laughs> so when he found out that you guys were borrowing his car more than he realized, what did he say to you guys? I don't know. He dealt with his brother, not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that of all the teammates you've ever had, who's been who's the one guy that could crack you up like no one else? Oh, Dougie Wait. Yeah, Dougie. Um, yeah, I guess it's between him and and Walt Kachuk, Keith. Mm-hmm. Those guys are we're, we've been very tight for a long time. But Dougie, Dougie, and I played on. So many teams together. We're very close. Our families are close, and we have the very the exact same sense of humor. Over the break, we just spent three days together, and it was nonstop. It was nonstop. It's just, uh, you know, uh, yeah. He's just he's just a funny guy. He's a, he's a great friend. We all we do is laugh when we're together. Mm-hmm. We just all we do is make fun of each other, and it's it's just you know, that's just it. He's 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 the best. The the one the story I remember just some of your stuff about your career. I love the story about the recruitment by Dallas. Like, did yeah. you did you know that Tom Hicks was going to knock on your door at midnight? No, that was that was Terry O'Reilly. That was from the ah. Rangers. Oh, I thought it was because someone said to me like like Tom Hicks sent the plane at midnight or something. No, he sent it. He came in that day. Okay, but at midnight, Terry, my wife and I were staying at a hotel in downtown Boston. And uh, uh, the the Rangers sent Terry because he was the assistant coach there at the time. Yeah. He was like my hero. Like I love Terry O'Reilly. Mm-hmm. Um, so they sent him over with uh, jer- a jersey for me, jerseys for the kids, a Tiffany apple with the Rangers thing on it for my wife, and this DVD with all these stars on it and stuff. And and then the next morning, Tom Hicks flew in on his plane with Doug Armstrong and. Uh, Dave Tippett, Guy Carbono, and uh, we met with them for for a while, and it was yeah, it was 
It was nuts. What was were the offers really like? Because you signed for five really times good. nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, were they all close? Like, did you ever turn your wife in the middle of that and say, holy smokes, like, I can't believe what's going on here? Yeah, they 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 were all really good. I had four. I had four really good offers. You know, one from New York, one from Dallas, one from Toronto, and one from Detroit. Kenny Holland and I laugh about it all the time. <laughs> and uh um, but there was there was always like something just off in the other ones. Um, and Dallas just seemed like such a good fit and, and, uh, you know, I really liked the team. The city seemed great and it ended up being great. And Mr. Hicks was a fantastic owner. And, you know, like I said, like it takes a lot to, he put a ton of money into that and, Mm -hmm. you know, he signed a bunch of guys. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a very cool experience. What was the Toronto pitch like? That's the thing that stood out to me. I didn't realize was that they were that big. uh, no, it was it was it's pretty much the same deal, and it was uh, Daryl Sittler didn't knock on your door or anything like that. No, or? no, no, it wasn't anything like that. It was it was straight straight about the money, and <laughs> um, but you know what I, I think uh, just you know knowing knowing like Mike Madano and a few other guys on the team, and, mm-hmm. you know Darian Hatcher, and just seeing what type of team that they had down there, that was that kind of swayed me down there. Do you still keep in touch with Crosby? Yes, I do. How often like do you text him or call him or anything like that? Every so often. I know he's playing now and yeah. you know, it's it's but anytime something funny comes up and or something from the past or or whatever and uh yeah, we'll we'll always text and we still have a good relationship. I texted him uh I was up in uh up in Halifax for the World Junior. Mhm. And I just texted him something like, man, the beer is really terrible up here. Nobody, <laughs> nobody likes to have a good time, <laughs> which is the complete opposite. It was absolutely amazing up there. And, um, but I know Sid's real proud of, of, of being from up, up there. Of course. Now, did you like, what was it like being a teammate with him and then being in the front office while he was there? Like, how did that, was that dynamic any different at all or anything? No. Uh, no, we, we, because again, I wasn't the general manager, right. so I could, I could keep, uh, uh, you know, I kept my distance, you know, first of all, and then second of all, if, if I ever changed, those guys would call me out on it so fast and I never wanted to do that. Even that's why I like, you know, even now, like, look, I am who I am. You know what? I, I like to, I like to poke fun at guys and I like to you know, have fun. I like to goof around a little bit, but like, so if I ever changed and if I tried to be like, you know, Joe serious and, you know, don't look at me after a loss or this or that guys would, guys would call me on it. My, my family would call me on it. Does, has anyone ever? No, because I learned that pretty early. Like somebody, Somebody one time gave me some advice. They're like, you got to get a little more serious and this and that. And you know what? I, I tried and you know, it just doesn't work for me. It's my, it's my personality, you know, and, and I'm not going to change who I am. Like just because I have a, a, a serious job, like it's, trust me, just like when I played, I, I can flip the switch. Like there's, there's, we'll get something, we'll get it done, but I'm also going to, I'm going to be who I am. Um, we talk a lot about Crosby. We talk about the Pittsburgh Penguins. Who is that? <laughs> 87, Cole Harbor, mm. pretty good little player. Doesn't, ring, doesn't ring a bell. Terrible tasting beer. Mount Rushmore, yeah, doesn't doesn't have good good beer in uh, in Nova Scotia. Oh, the kid with the sweaty hat. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah with and the, the jock from Pee Wee that he's been wearing for his yeah. entire life. Um, I don't know that we know a lot about Malkin. Like, I don't, I've never had the feeling that and I he really likes it that know, way. and that's what I'm thinking, like, I don't know that we know him and he's like the Hall of Fame awaits, like right down the street from where we're doing. Yeah. This is the Hockey Hall of Fame and he's going there. He's one going day. there. Um, what do you think people should know about him? How funny he is. He is absolutely hysterical. He's got a great sense of humor. Um, he, he's very just, he's really sharp too. You know, he's, he's just a really funny guy. Like I sat next to him in the dressing room. And he would just be like, you know, he he'd just throw a little shot here, you know, every once in a while, and yeah. he'd like look at look look at my skates, and he'd be he'd like, oh, now I know why you're so slow, 
<laughs> something like that. Like in, and he just, you know, he always called me, get in, get in and do this and do that and get out of the way. And, but he, he's a really funny guy and yeah. he cares. He cares. One, uh, w- one last thing on Crosby just hit it in my mind. I remember, um, it's a great story about Colby Armstrong and the first time he saw Sid working out. And he went over to Sid and said something along the lines of, is there like another league higher than the NHL yeah. that we don't know about that you're, that you're trying to get to? Was it like the first time you saw Sid working out? Like, what was he like in the gym? In the gym? I mean, in the gym, he was, I was never in there, so I don't know. <laughs> but no, the, the big thing for me was practice. Yep. And how serious he took practice. You know, by that time in my my uh, career, I was 38. Um, you know, my body wasn't what it used to be. I could I could manage my way through practices, and mm-hmm. and he would come over. He's like, he's like, come on, like we we gotta go. Like, and I'm looking at him like, oh, okay. So I had to start picking it up and stay stay up to speed with him in practice and push harder just to just to keep up with him and, and, and Chris Kunitz too. We, you know, it was, he was great for me at, at that point in time in my career, but his, his drive, you know, was, uh, was unbelievable in practice. See, to, to me, that's why he should always be considered in the Hart trophy race yeah. for how he sets like this work rate for his team that you have to, you have to at least try to approach. There is a standard in Pittsburgh that is so high. It is so high that, I mean, I would I would think most teams can't match, and it's because of him. If you don't come into camp tip-top shape, focused and ready to go, you're not going to succeed there because mm-hmm. of him. Hmm. I, I wanted to ask you, joining New Jersey, you walk in, Stevens, Danico, Niedermeyer, yeah. Like these were all hard, determined guys, yeah. and you're like, did they? You're you take yourself seriously. Nobody plays as long as you did, but you like to have fun. Yeah. Like, did you? Did it? Did it ever not? Were you ever worried it wasn't going to mix there? Your personality. Oh no, no, theirs? no. We had a. Oh, trust me, we had a bunch of guys. But it's funny. The fir- my first call up, the first day I got called up to play in the NHL, the first guy I met was Tommy Abilene. And he helped me with my stuff and walked into South Mountain Arena, our our old practice rink. And I met Scotty right away. And he was like getting ready for practice and he didn't have a shirt on. I was like, oh my God. (laughs) I got, he's on my team, right? (laughs) And, uh, but we, we had, um, yeah. And Scotty was very serious. Yeah. Neater was, Neater was a young guy. Like he was just 19 years old or whatever. Serious, you Mm know? Um, but we had a bunch, like, Kenny Danico was a riot. Chris Terreri was great. Randy McKay was great. Johnny McClain. Randy McKay. We had some. We had some really. We had some really fun guys. Like it was. I mean, we had we had a great time there. So, you know, Jacques Lemaire. Jacques was serious. Yes, <laughs> it was very serious. serious. <laughs> yes, but very we, serious. But we had a great team. We it was. You know, we used to go to this. Uh, we used to go to this little bar in Verona, New Jersey, called the Verona Inn. It's, uh, you know. And, and and we would go there as a team. And um, my wife was actually a bartender there um, Wednesday nights. And uh, um, but we would go there as a team. And it was players, wives, girlfriends, fathers, brothers, whoever was in town. Oh, yeah. And we just go. And we were just it was like a family. It really was. And you just took care of each other and simple guys, but man, we we yeah, we had a great time. We could just trap it up like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that's where you met your wife there, right? At that bar? I or? did. The owner of the bar was a really good friend of mine, mm-hmm. actually. And he has since moved to Minnesota. He was friends with both of us and he introduced us. Mm-hmm. Um and it, yeah, it's just it's actually a crazy story because let's hear it. Well, so so we left New Jersey. And his name's Marty Robinson, and Marty's a great guy. And Marty's ten years older than me, um, so we we left. We got traded to Edmonton, and our you know carousel of teams starts. And Marty sells his bar and starts in a in a different business with uh, um, 
kind of Homeland Security, airport security. And he's been to, you know, uh, Fort Myers. He just did four years in, in Tokyo. And he calls us a couple of years ago and he says, Hey, uh, uh, what are the schools like in Minnesota? And we're like, what are you, what are you talking about? He's like, well, I'm getting transferred and I have my choice between Salt Lake City and Minneapolis. He goes, we're coming to Minneapolis. So this guy that we've been friends with all these years and now who is, who is, you know, married and has four kids. I don't know how he does it at 62, but, <laughs> um, but him and his family live, uh, 10 minutes down the road from us in Minnesota and we're, we're still thick as thieves. It's, it's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a really cool story. It's kind of great having like him and his, him, him and his family in, in our life again. And it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about your team and yeah. I've, I've mentioned this in a couple of places. Um, I think that your build, like the style of team that you're building with Minnesota is the envy of a lot of other teams in the NHL. Like when I hear what the Philadelphia Flyers want to do with their team, I think every time it might be in John Tortorella's voice, but that's Bill Guerin's team that he's talking about. Like when you think about what you want this team to be. Like I look at skill, I see toughness, like there's a whole, like you can play a lot of different ways. Like when you look at what team you want, I know you're not going to say you're, you're there yet because you haven't won the Stanley cup, but is this your team? This is what, is this what you've wanted? This style of team? First of all, thank you. Um, yeah, it is. Um, I just feel like to be successful, you you have to be able to play uh, different types of games, different environments. Um, there's you need a certain level of grit and toughness, and that comes in different ways. You know, uh, Ryan Reeves is a very tough guy in one way, or a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. but he's a tough guy. Kirill Kaprizov is also a very tough guy. He doesn't back away from anything. He wins all his battles. He goes to the traffic. Mm -hmm. Both tough guys, both very different. And you have to have everybody in between that doing the same thing. Same thing with Zuki. Zuki's, you know, a, a smaller player, um, but he's got, he's got jam. He's got, you know, he's, he, he's brave. Like these guys are just, you need that. And you know what? I, I, I just, I want, our team to be able to play their best game in the most hostile environment. Hmm. So if you're playing another tough team and the crowd's crazy and all that stuff, I want our team to be so mentally tough too that we can play our best game in that environment. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's great. The, the stakes always get higher, right? And as you go, as you move up the ladder in, in the playoffs and things like that, the intensity gets better. And so you, you have to play your best game then. Who was a guy you played with we might not think of who was always phenomenal in those situations? You know who was great in those games? Jason Smith. Hmm. Jason Smith. He played he hard, man. Unbelievable. Yeah. Like you talk about, you talk about like a warrior. Like, you shake his hand now. His fingers are all over the place. Like it's like I don't, <laughs> I don't even know if he could put a glove on. Like he blocking shots, yep. uh, just you know, doing all the dirty stuff to play, like just at, at such a high level in 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 tough games. I, I he was a great he's a great teammate. He's a really good friend. But man, was he was he was he tough? Like just uh, he stepped up all the time. I'm going to ask you what might seem, and I can already hear Elliot's eyeballs roll <laughs> because I go on about this guy and this one skill countless times, and Elliot knows where I'm going here. I don't know that there's a better or faster backward skater in the league oh than gosh. Jonas Brodeen. Uh -huh. Have you seen or do you know a better backward skater than Jonas Brodeen? No. No. I think Brodes... Brodes, I mean, it's no secret. He doesn't have the offensive side. Right. Of uh, of the game, 
at an elite level. If he did, his his defensive game is as good as any Norris Trophy candidate or better. He can defend as well or better than the so-called top guys. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't produce. And you know what? For us, that's okay. He, like you said, like you watch his, just watch his feet. Like how many times he's crossing over, how many, like his escape moves. He's a one man breakout. And you know what? It's, he is an elite defender. Like when, you know, when you go against the, the McDavid's and McKinnon's and guys like that, you can, you have him out there against them because of that. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Is, is that, I don't want to say it's a lost art because players do it. Um, but when you look at the nature of players, defensemen that are coming up from youth hockey, they're coming up from minor hockey. Everybody wants to jump in and chip in and offense and look at my edges and check out my fancy C cuts and all of it, right? Oh, yeah. The ability to defend. I don't want to see, is it be, or I don't want to ask, is it becoming a lost art? But are kids putting enough emphasis on being able to defend? Because it seems every year at the draft, we look at defensemen and it's the same things over and over. It's great. Everyone wants to be Kel McCarr now. I get it. But do enough young players still want to defend? No. No. Because they don't put a, they don't put high enough value on it. Mm. You know, they see it, you know, and hey, I, I think, I think McCarr is probably the number two player in the league. Like, I, I think that much of him, but he's after Kaprizov. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, he's so special that, you know, a guy like that, you just, he, he's going to do what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. But most of the young players now, like, you know, even probably at the youth level, it starts, but like, they see the, the fancy stuff, you know, the trick shots and this and that. And if you're a defenseman, the one thing you have to do in this league is defend. If you can't defend, you better be Kale McCarr or Carlson or Dowdy mm. or somebody that drives offense like at an incredible rate because there's no room in this game for a specialty player. Like you just can't, you can't do it. You a coach won't trust you. He won't want to put you on the ice. And you just, yeah, you have to be able to defend. And that goes for that goes for forwards mm -hmm. too. You if you're not good defensively, you better be racking up some serious points. If you can't play a lot, if you don't have good wall play, you you better be doing something really special on the other end of it. And it took me a long time to figure that out too. But <laughs> um <laughs> But it, look, coaches love. They don't like giving up goals. They they don't like being in the defensive zone. So you have to be able to defend. You have to be able to get out of your own end. You have to, you know, do do some of those things that that aren't sexy. Trade deadline on the horizon after that GM meetings. What's a front burner issue for Bill Guerin at the GM meetings? You know, I was just talking to somebody about this, and I, I don't. I think the game's in a pretty good spot, but I I think I'd like to look at the the playoff format. You know, maybe going back to the one through eight. But again, that's so on the surface because mm -hmm. you know I can say that because you know you look at some of the matchups that have happened in the first round, and you're losing two really good or you're losing at least one really good team way too early um but i know it's just it's just not that simple you know what i mean there's so much kind of like i was talking about how it takes so much to put a game together mm -hmm. like it takes so much to just make a change like that it's not just hey you know we're gonna we're gonna do it i mean the league has to do so many different things in in order for that to happen and it, it's really tough to argue with, with the success our league has had, um, you know, in the last the last while. So, um, I I do think our game's in a pretty good spot, um, but but that would be one for me. I there's always like little little things here and there with different rules, like you know I, I'm right right now I'm seeing like more 
interference and we've seen in years past like mm-hmm. can there be a crackdown on that like if a guy dumps a puck in the defenseman isn't supposed to be able to really hold him up but i see it all the time now you know is that one little thing that we can get better on kind of like we got better on the slashing and the cross checks and things mm-hmm. like that um but i don't know I, I i think we're in a pretty good spot are picks a big issue yes seven of Toronto, a- Tampa, they were. yes they are Excellent point. We got called for it two nights ago, and then I, I've seen it five times since. And it's it's a tough it's a tough call. Like it's, but it is it is happening. Mm-hmm. You know, especially when it's uh, especially like four on four and things like that. When there's more movement, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that. Do you expect that to come up at the GMs? Yeah, maybe. Well, no. <laughs> Expanded playoffs? Yes or no? I I could I could be sold on maybe like a play in. I think I have to I have to maybe think a little bit deeper about it. I'm usually more inclined to stay with tradition, but when I first came in the league, there were 21 teams and 16 made the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Now there's 32 and 16 make the playoffs. Again, it's not that easy. It's not easy just saying, hey, we're going to add a bunch of teams mm-hmm. and let's go. There's, you know, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that I don't even know about that I, but I do know that there's a bunch of things that has to go into it mm-hmm. in order for it to change. And, um, you know, that, that's, yeah, but that's one of the things that, that would probably come up. I have two last ones. Number one, I want to ask you about Greenway. You know, uh, you know, he's, he had a situation where he overslept and he, and he was late for a game. Um, I, I really like watching the guy play. How do you handle that kind of a situation with a young player? Well, you have to have accountability. And, you know, we, we held Jordan accountable. He's not a bad kid. He's, he's actually a great kid. I mm-hmm. love being around him. He's, he's got a good heart. We've all made mistakes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, it wasn't a malicious thing. He didn't, he wasn't, he didn't break the law or anything like that, but he, he, he was late and he didn't play that night. And that was, and that was it. But you know what? You don't, you don't, it's not like we're beating the guy up either. We're not, it's not like we won't talk to him the next day or this and that or anything like that. It's just, just move on. Mm hmm. You have to hold people accountable. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we all have to be held accountable at some point in time, right? And it's just, if you don't, it's, if you don't, it, it really gets to be a runaway train. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, you're in uncharted territory next year. You're going into a situation where you're going to have a cap issue like nobody's ever had before. How do you prepare for that? And I guess the other only other question I have for you, Bill, is there, would you ever, would you change your decision at all? Like, so you wouldn't be in this kind of situation. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I would not change my decision at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's, it was best for everyone. And I think a lot of people, most people focus on the two players that we bought out. And it wasn't just that. It was, it was, you know, like we didn't bring back Miko Koivu. And, and Miko's a great guy. Like he's, he's a friend and, um, He's, you know, he's an all-time franchise player for Minnesota. We didn't bring him back. Um, we didn't bring back, you know, we got rid of guys like Dubnik and Eric Stahl and Jason Zucker, guys who did some really great things in Minnesota. And we're, but we had to change. And you know what? In order to change, sometimes you have to make really tough decisions. And and so, you know, we're going to deal with the consequences of that. And I'd do it again. I think we're, I think we're fine. And I know these cat. We're we're in one right now. Mm-hmm. You know we're we're minus twelve million in in the cap, and you have a lot of space. You've managed. And we beautifully. have a lot of space. Yeah, like so, we don't use it as a, as an excuse whatsoever. Um, I'm not going to say it's it's not going to be difficult, but we have to. We just have to plan for it, and you know, target certain players and certain. Um, at certain uh, you know pay levels that that we feel that that can help us because we won't use it as an excuse. Hmm. The expectations will stay the same. Let me pick up on that because I was I was talking to someone yesterday 
um, from another team. And I said, hey, Elliot and I are sitting down with Bill Guerin. What do you think of him as a general manager? And this person said to me, I like Bill Guerin because he behaves like a businessman. That if something's not working, he'll just eat it, move on, don't worry about the criticism, do what's right. He said the game would be a lot better off if people behaved more like businessmen and said, you know what? This doesn't work. So you know what? Take the loss, move on and, and, and keep going. How do you react to that? Boy, if my father could have heard that, <laughs> yeah, he'd be, he would have been shocked. I, I take that as a huge compliment and, um, I'm, you know, it makes me proud to hear that. I, you know, I, I, I try to, I try to be very honest with myself and everybody around and I'm okay with, if, if something doesn't work out, it's okay. Like, it hasn't worked out for a lot of people. And, but you know, and it's something I learned from Jim too, Jim Rutherford, like just move. Don't, don't waste any time. And I, I feel like sometimes like we can get caught up in, in winning a trade or winning this or winning that. When if I waste time and I don't deal with the problem right away, it's only going to hurt our team. And, you know, it, it goes back to the, even like the Cam Talbot trade. I wasn't going to trade Cam at all. But we had this situation that came up over draft weekend. And, um, dis- you know what? I thought about it for, you know, a good part of the day. And I'm like, you know what? This isn't going to work. So I traded him. And, you know, you not, not to say that, uh, you know, Cam's a really good guy and, all, there was nothing really wrong, but I just had a feeling that it wasn't going to work, and I just moved on it, and it's it's worked out really well for us. That was awesome. Great. Thanks, Thanks very much, Bill. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, I hope you liked it. Yeah, this is fun. This is awesome. You guys obviously do a great job, and I appreciate you having me on. You ball for your next shot. Anytime for a regular road trip. Great to see you. Great to see you too. Good luck tonight, hey? Thanks, buddy.